when we are attending to the present, regardless of the activity that we're doing, we rate our mood higher, we rate our happiness higher. You're listening to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast, the show that blends science and heart to bring you evidence-based tips and tricks for cultivating a healthy, wealthy, and meaningful life. Now, here's your host, therapist, yogi, and fellow full life balancer, Dr. Caitlin Harkis. Hi there, welcome to Wisdom for Wellbeing. I am really excited about this week's episode. It's one that I've wanted to create for a while because I think it's really beneficial to understand what is going on in you know, the vacant moments in our mind. And what I mean by this is the default mode network. Now, if you haven't heard of the default mode network, that is really the deep dive that we are doing today. So I know, or I very much hope that by the end of this episode, you'll have more of a sense as to what the default mode network is. But just to contextualize it a little bit, I'd like to jump back to some really interesting research that was done at Harvard in 2010. So a bunch of individuals were texted, they were sent a text message at various times in their day just to check in on how they were doing. You know, they were essentially asked, you know, how are you feeling right now? What are you doing right now? And asked to rate this on a scale of 10 to 100. And then they were asked additional questions. They were asked, you know, are you thinking about something other than what you are currently doing? And then asked to describe whether what they were thinking about other than what they were currently doing was unpleasant, neutral, pleasant. Um, And with this, so the, the research was actually conducted by Killingsworth and Gilbert. They found that individuals are presently focused, like actually attending to what is going on in this moment in their day for about just over half of the day. So that meant that 47% of an individual's waking life, they were thinking of something other than what they were doing. So that's really interesting. So what this means is that for us as human beings on the whole, because generally we are not that different from any of the individuals who would have been getting these text messages, you know, nearly half of our day, we are not really here. We are somewhere else thinking of something else. And what's even more interesting is that when we are attending to the present, regardless of the activity that we're doing, we rate our mood higher, we rate our happiness higher. So that means that if you are taking out the trash and you are presently focused on the task, maybe the weight of the bag, the cool air as you open the door, the sounds of the bird, you are going to rate your mood higher than if you are in a bubble bath, you've got a candle going, and you're thinking about what happened earlier in the day, you know, that meeting with your boss or what you've got on your agenda for tomorrow. So that means that present moment awareness operates independent of what you're actually thinking about, whether it's something that's delightful, you know, positive daydreaming, neutral, or um, maybe not very pleasant. So this is, this is incredible, and this is something that I've talked about on Wisdom for Wellbeing before, and that's why I wanted to jump in with this episode, because we talk here about why present moment awareness is so important, this ability to tune in to what is happening during our day, and, and spoiler alert, we're going we're gonna to be heading there later in this episode as well. But what we haven't really talked about is what is going on when you are thinking about something other than what you are currently doing. You know, what is that? So this is what Eastern contemplative traditions would call your monkey mind state. And it's what modern science calls the default mode network. 
So we are diving into the default mode network here and my intention is to really give you language around the experience that you're having on the daily. You know, in fact, multiple times a day and arguably nearly half of your day, you are existing in this default mode network. You know, this is, I think, really important to understand. And while this episode is not going to be a neuroanatomy lesson, I want you to learn the language of what's happening so that you can have a clearer and more compassionate understanding of your mind's automatic patterns and then some tools to short circuit this default mode network so that you can come back to the present moment when doing so is beneficial for you. So while not a neuroanatomy lesson, I think it is helpful just for me to language and label some of the parts of your brain that are involved in this default mode network. So there is the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior singular cortex, and the inferior parietal lobe. So during waking hours, we know that these parts of your brain are operating, like they're consuming a lot of energy. And these are the parts of your brain that are self-referential in nature. So this is the I, me, mining of your brain, or what we might call selfing, this construct of yourself, who you are, what you do. These are the parts of your brain that are involved in social evaluations, you know, comparing yourself, judging things, thinking about who, why, what, and the time traveling, right? So this is thinking about the past, you know, past memories. Um, Sometimes we might call some of this stuff rumination and thinking about the future, which might be anticipating, getting excited and worrying, So basically, these are the states that pull your attention out of the present moment into what we might call wandering, wandering states. And this can be quite problematic when we find ourselves held hostage by this, you know, particularly when we are ruminating about the past Um, That's associated with states of depression, worrying about the future is associated with anxiety. And while this is a really important function, you know, our brains evolved in a context to allow us to survive. So being able to remember the past and plan for the future has incredible survival functions. This is what allowed us to go, wow, when I went that path, I saw a tiger. Or when we didn't stockpile food, we got hungry, right? This is really, really important for your brain to do. And it makes sense that it's the default, that that's where your mind is going to go in the so-called vacant moments, the moments when you are not immediately consumed, involved in the present moment. However, it's in the present moment where things like awe exist and flow. These are really beautiful spaces and we'll talk more about them, but it's important to understand that while that's not the default, it's because you know, happiness, contentment doesn't necessarily have survival value. You know, learning, reasoning, planning, that is survival and nature doesn't care if you are happy. (laughs) You know, it evolved so that you could pass on your genes. So it makes sense when, you know, we talked about the social comparison function of the default mode network. It makes sense that we are comparing ourselves, considering what others think, you know, and in modern times, this might be, oh, you know, what are my colleagues thinking about me right now? Was that appropriate when that person cut me off in that meeting? You know, social approval matters from an evolutionary perspective because we don't have the claws and the teeth to survive on our own. We are interdependent. We are beings that require our community for survival by our very nature and while the context is different now um, you know we can live pretty insular lives in some ways we are so dependent in terms of even when we go to the grocery shop now aren't we but the the facts is that our brains are going to be wired to really hone in on our sense of social connectedness and evaluation in that sense, as well as reflecting on when we saw that snake, when we went out for our walk the other day, what happened, how close were we, what was going on? The brain has a negativity bias in all of this. So when something is perhaps 
otherwise neutral, our brain is probably going to put a negative spin on it. Because when we think about things in that negative light, in that survival light, we are likely to pick up on the dangers. If in the case of that snake in that run, I went in with a positive spin and went, oh, I wasn't that close, it wasn't that dangerous, I might not then be more careful tomorrow, more aware tomorrow. If I go, wow, that snake was huge, that was dangerous, that was a close call, I'm going to be really careful tomorrow. And in times past, and even now, if we're going out for walks or runs where there's snakes and you're living in Australia, to contextualize that, it is really sensible that our brain does that. So this is really tough because that means that there is, in a way, some suffering embedded into the human human experience, right? When we are defaulting to this, this network of, you know, not present moment awareness coupled with this negativity bias, our brains can go to pretty unhelpful, unpleasant places. Yet there is plasticity. You might have heard the term neuroplasticity in our brains. We can rewire. So if you have walked, for instance, a path numerous times, it essentially becomes a path. You know, walking through the forest, if you take the same route again and again, you're wearing down a path. I really like a snow example, which, you know, I'm living in Australia now. I grew up in Canada. This um, this may make more or less sense, but let me describe it. If you're going tobogganing on a snow hill and you go down with your toboggan, your sled, um, the first time, the second time, if you start off at virtually the same point, you're very likely to take the same route because you've indented that snow already. So the default is going to be to fall back into that well-worn path. And the more you do this again and again, it would be harder and harder to steer, to lean out of the well-worn path because it's getting deeper. And this is the same with our thoughts. So when we head to this default mode network and we get hooked, we get caught, we get engaged in particular thinking patterns, particular thinking ways, the more we do this, the deeper the path becomes. So we're essentially wiring pathways in our brain. This means that if we have you know, painful thoughts, challenging thoughts, and we've been there a lot, it is naturally going to be harder not to go there. We're going to go there pretty quickly, pretty unconsciously. I'm going to jump back into another metaphor. We're sort of on that train of thinking. So it's a pretty quick train. We might not realize that we've jumped on the wrong train and suddenly we're like 10 stops down the path. You know, we've been on this train for perhaps hours. Less worn paths, maybe, you know, it takes some awareness when we hop onto the train or maybe we notice we're on a new train a couple stops in and we can choose whether this is a helpful train to be on whether it's taking us to the destination we want to go and we might then choose to get off what we can do when we've got these really well-worn paths is we can start to step off the train by noticing that we've gone into the default mode network that we've gone into these you know snow paths that we've jumped onto the train by cultivating present moment awareness skills and you know circumnavigating that negativity bias by cultivating daily gratitude practices where we actually focus on the positive the joys in our lives balancing that negativity bias with really deliberate exercises in positivity So when I talk about ways to cultivate present moment awareness, you know, and to essentially cultivate cognitive flexibility so we can choose what train we're going to get on, the mental habits that we are going to feed and engage in, meditation is a really useful skill. So I'm going to differentiate between present moment awareness and meditation. Present moment awareness is this ability to connect into what is going on now, to be here now, as it's often often said. Meditation is a deliberate practice. You know, it can be done formally in the case of sitting meditation or, you know, mindful movement practices like yoga, or it can be done informally. You can, you can mindfully, um, you know, have a shower and wash the dishes. So these mindfulness practices might support present moment awareness as does formal meditation practices or, 
what we might describe as formal mindfulness practices, which we can differentiate further, but I don't know that that's going to serve our purposes right now. I want to keep going and describe why this is important because with mindfulness, with awareness of your mind and where it's at, you're essentially cultivating something called metacognition. Metacognitive awareness allows you to notice where your brain is, to notice what train you're on, to notice what track you're on. So meta just means kind of above. So when you're noticing your cognition, you are not necessarily enmeshed, fused with the cognitive process. You're noticing it, which is really, really incredible. And I think that this is important because we know that Um, meditation and mindfulness influence your default mode network activity. So essentially turning off the default mode network because you have this ability to be here now. And specifically it's measurable. So again, we're not going to go hugely into the neuroanatomy, but your brain has something called gray matter. And what is noticed in an average of you know, 27 minutes a day of a mindfulness meditation practice, there is growth in the gray matter associated with, you know, your sense of empathy and um, changes in the way that you're processing memory and your sense of self leading to a broader connected sense of self and shrinkage in the gray matter associated with things like stress. So by engaging in mindfulness practice, meditation practices, you're changing how your brain is functioning which is incredible. We can actually see it. So it's not just that when we meditate, when we practice mindfulness, we go, wow, like I feel pretty good after, you know, have these subjective experiences of benefit. We see measurable changes in the brain. So this accounts for some of the cognitive and psychological benefits that persist beyond periods of meditation, right? So it's not just that when you're sitting, you might experience a change in your affective state. It's that when you get up from the cushion, you know, the chair, you know, the bed, wherever you've been engaged in your practice, there are now structural differences in the brain that influence how you perceive, for instance, stress. Incredible, given that we know the trajectory is high levels of stress make us more likely to experience clinical levels of anxiety, which make us more likely to experience a depressive episode. And we know then through additional research that default mode network activity, like increased default mode network activity is associated with anxiety, with depression, and with schizophrenia. So this is incredible. And I mean, there's additional benefits to engaging in mindfulness practices, meditation practices. We know that it boosts your immune system, um, lowers your blood pressure. So it's pretty much beneficial, you know, for every system of your body, good for your brain and body. So we also then kind of go, okay, well, why, why is this meaningful in the broad sense. And and maybe this is just a question I ask, you know, maybe this is enough. Maybe the fact that meditation, meditation, mindfulness is so good for your brain and body is enough of a motivator. But there's something else. There's this experience of awe, you know, delight, captivation in the moment that I think is incredibly important, meaningful in our lives. And this requires present moment awareness. You know, you cannot delight in the pink of the sunset, the birds as they sing their song in the tree, if you are really actively planning that self-righteous email to your colleague, you know, describing how they publicly took credit for your idea in yesterday's work meeting, and that's not okay, and I had that idea, I've worked so hard, kind of going into that train of thought. We've all been there. We all get it, right? Like we are all spending most of our days involved in this train of thought. And maybe that means we're missing out on delighting in that beetle as it walks across the sidewalk. If we're actively balancing this natural wiring of the brain with mindfulness practice, meditation practices, we can come into these moments of awe, of delight. You know, we're 
at least cultivating the conditions for contentment, you know, perhaps happiness. We are essentially strengthening the muscle that allows us these moments of joy so that we are then less dependent on external circumstances. Contentment doesn't come from everyone at work then acknowledging your idea and, you know, really admiring you. Sure, that might bring you a moment of pleasure, but what if by rewiring your brain, you know, becoming in control of where your mind is spinning to, you know, stopping this battle of reference to the self, the past, the present, the future, comparing with others. What if you come back into this moment, this present moment, the way things are right now, and there's joy in that? You know, suddenly happiness, contentment, joy becomes this muscle you train rather than something you need to change circumstances for or achieve. And additionally, a flow state, you might have heard of flow. So this is a highly focused state that is associated with human performance. When you cultivate the ability to be here now, when you cultivate the ability to be focused on what you are doing, you are essentially cultivating the conditions whereby you might enter a state of flow. And a state of flow, you know, when we say it's associated with human performance, we might think that this means that more of your brain goes online or lights up. But what we actually find is when you're entering a flow state, parts of your brain are actually shutting down. You know, specifically the transient hypofrontality is what it's called, transient hypofrontality, where you essentially lose this sense of yourself, that I, me, mine. You become immersed in the present moment. You are stepping back from turning down the higher cognitive functions that are involved in complex decision making, you know, your sense of morality, you know, that selfing idea, and the calculation of time, which accounts for this timelessness, this sense of broadness that happens in a state of flow. You know, you're shutting down the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this inner critic part of you that is constantly judging, evaluating, and naturally then in this state, creativity is experienced because we're no longer then so self-conscious, right? So your creativity is enhanced in the state of flow as well as your risk-taking. And essentially, you then get this perfect neurochemical concoction of norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, these neurochemicals that feel so good. And it's cultivated by meditation, or at least, you know, you set the tone, you increase the likelihood that then when you engage in activities where you balance your skill, with the demands of the activity, you're more likely to enter a state of flow. So flow has been described by chess players, artists, yogis, swimmers, golfers, even individuals, you know, actively engaged in their writing, their work can enter this highly focused state, this timelessness state of flow. And I find that really motivating. It might mean that you engage in a number of meditation practices that are challenging because ultimately the purpose of mindfulness of meditation is not to feel good. You know, the intention of sitting on your cushion is not for relaxation. The intention is to sit and to notice what's there you know, to be able to cultivate your attentional skills and to be able to notice name and essentially, hopefully over time, right? Like tame the emotional experiences that come up. Because if you notice these emotional experiences, you know, these thought patterns, these physical sensations, these urges, these memories as transient as products of a mind that thinks, you're essentially allowing yourself to step back from them, to step back from them. And as you step back from them, you notice that this is your mind minding. This is what your mind does in these moments. You're essentially stepping back from the train of your thoughts then onto the platform. You know, and as you practice meditation, you're learning to slow down the train. You know, you're de-automatizing the thoughts 
that maybe have become automatic over time because that's where you've gone many times before. And as you de-automatize, you have the flexibility to choose to engage in to establish, to, you know, essentially go down the snow track of mental habits, behavior patterns that take you to a place of vitality in your life, a place where you're acting in alignment with your heart, with your values. So while I think it's really important that we are compassionate when our mind jumps into the default mode network, when we feel all these, you know, likely given the negativity bias, negative thoughts kind of coming up and spinning and churning, that we're compassionate with ourselves because that is wired, right? We are creatures who evolve to survive, to pass on our genes. And I know when I wake up, my mind kind of wanders somewhere And I've gotten quicker at noticing where it's gone. And I think you'll get quicker too, right? It's not that we need to be perfect. And when our mind wanders somewhere dark and we suddenly go, wow, like I've been on this track for, you know, hours or minutes, who knows, depends where we're at. But when we notice that, can we be compassionate to ourselves? Can we accept that we are the product of evolution, that this is what our mind does? And we can cultivate this metacognitive awareness of our mind to notice where it's gone more effectively over time, to jump off the train, and then to come back to the present moment, knowing that even if we are doing something that might be fairly neutral or unpleasant, if we are focused on what we are doing now, that is likely to be a more contented place of existence rather than our mind wandering. So with that, I will leave you to practice some kindness, some compassion as you talk to yourself, as you notice, name, and tame the active engagement of your default mode network, the monkey mind. And I would love to connect with you next week here on Wisdom for Wellbeing. If you have been enjoying these episodes, if you're getting something from them, I would so appreciate if you'd take a moment to leave a review wherever you're listening to this episode. It really helps to spread the word. And then head on over to at Dr. Caitlin on socials to connect there. And I can share more thoughts, more exploration of our mind-body connection of the wisdom that we can establish and cultivate in our lives. Wishing you and yours well. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week on the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. Please visit drcaitlin.com to connect find show notes, other episodes, and to subscribe. While you're at it, if you find value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating or perhaps simply tell a friend about the show. Wisdom for Wellbeing is not a substitute for professional, individualized mental health treatment. If you are in crisis, please contact 000, your local emergency number if you are outside of Australia or attend your local hospital ED.